And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother in arms, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. And... Yep. I'm also this uh, this day the uh, harbinger of the greatness of all things Super Robot Wars, but that's not why we're here at this valley. No. Just remember, Super Robot Wars 30 is on North American Steam. Get it while you fucking can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, some of you may be looking at this and looking at your calendar, going, "Wait, isn't it a little bit too early? What's this?" Yes, we, we will be doing the usual Valley of the Judge on, fr on Friday, but given what, ca given what came out um, yesterday, I decided to call a bit of an audible. So, some of you may recall that a, while, that a few months back, Zan and I did a, uh, did a Valley of the Judge episode on a Dicebreaker article for, for Mayfair Games' upcoming um, Avatar RPG. Well... Not in lieu of the fact that they'll be doing a Kickstarter for this thing sometime next month, they have released a quick start for, a quick start PDF for what is called Avatar Legends. They finally haven't they finally have a name for the thing, because um, I guess calling it Avatar: The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra is going to be too long for the, the cover. Um, not to, not to mention the fact that since they're focusing on the world of Avatar, it makes sense not to call it by either of the previous titles. Well, they they claim to be focusing on the world of of Avatar, but we'll get to that later. Um, the kick the quick start is fifty five pages, which is pretty decent for a quick start, I'd say. Um, but the main reason that I want that I wanted to cover it in this form instead of doing a first unimpressions on my own is because of the fact that we kind of set we kind of set ourselves up with this set with this setup when we um co when we covered that dice breaker article i figured this would be a good opportunity to fire off Chekhov's gun um so that, now obvious now um am i go am i going to am i going to back the kickstarter proper probably not will i will i be reviewing the full on game Probably not. I'll, pro I'll probably just I'll probably just do a um, Mythos Miscellany on other g on other games that have done the Avatar thing and better, including one using PBTA, which uh, which we'll get with and we'll get to that a in a bit. But this particular this particular quick start, um, it does what you'd ex structurally is about what you'd expect. You know, introducing the setting, introducing the basics of the rules, having a few pregens, and and um and a sample adventure. Basic stuff. Yeah, but the very first thing that that, that I see that's a red flag, and is a smaller red flag, and actually I have to admit is is a smaller and smaller red flag the more and more we talk with Ash. Um, because it's a it's a lesser consideration compared to other things gameplay wise is mm -hmm. at the very beginning it's thing about being a family friendly game open to anyone and you might even use the X card system <laughs> we've r lampooned the X card numerous times mm -hmm. across the ages that's not going to be dug into depth here but that right there is tiny red flag of Still pushing agendas, but even then, um, like I said, talking more and more with Ash, looking more at material considerations behind design and gameplay, uh, these red flags are less noticeable than other red flags. Yeah. Um, and as for now, um, obvious, obviously, when obviously the one thing that we're never going to know about this is how is how much. Um, how much le how much leeway Magpie Games has, and how much and how much oversight um, Vi Viacom has when it comes to when it comes to this project. Um, based on how, based on how I've seen other 
IP to video game approaches. I'd imagine that Vi I'd imagine that Viacom is very is very ha either very hands off or very meddlesome, and I it's in all likelihood probably the f probably the former. Um, especially since especially and I know some I know some people will bring up things like like um, say licensed video game licensed video games based on um, comic book characters and the like, but. For mo for the most part, when it comes to when it comes to any sort of IP being adapted into another medium, it's a case of here here's the they throw the IP to someone and just and just say have at it. The sales will probably come because of the name. Um, now sometimes we luck out and they and it's actually given to a proper studio, like say NeverSoft with the Spider-Man PS1 game. Um, so, but other times you have it's given to people who have no business doing what they're what they're being told to do, like say, Turbine when it came to Infinite Crisis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hand hand over hand over the hand over. It, give a mo, give a assign a MOBA game to a company that has never done MOBAs before. Turbine up to that point, their big claim to fame was stuff like Lord of the Rings Online. You see the problem here? Uh huh. Um. Now they do. They do have a. They do have a. A mini story. That's th that's the kind of thing that would be taken straight out of um a, a White Wolf project. Um. And we. We have we um have a overview of the world of Avatar. Um. I'm not entirely sure why they why they felt that they needed to put in bold the whole inspired by Asian and North American indigenous cultures. Oh wait, I already know why because because I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure in the GM section of the full book there will be that diatribe that we la that we lampooned last time. Yeah, probably. Um that diatribe about about uh a diatribe that shows how racist they are in assuming that only Eastern Asian cultures have dragons or something. Mm -hmm. Um, we get we get into a spiel about the about the four about the four nations, and and talking talking about the about the era which you play in which each nation acts as a backdrop, a bit of an aside on the United Republic. Um. And then they have then they have a thing of playing through the er playing through the eras, listing off um, five e five eras: Kyoshi's era, i.e., the events after the Shadow of Kyoshi novel, which I haven't read. Um, Roku Roku's era, so just be the time just before the arrival of Sozin's comet and the start of the Hundred Year War. Um, the Hundred Year War era, so essentially. Essentially, the time just before Ang Ang awoke at the beginning of Last Airbender, um, Ang's era, self-explanatory, and Korra's era. Although there's there's one there, the last sentence in in um Korra's er, in Korra's era does make me tilt my head a bit. They do said they do mention that it that it's also bringing in the Ruins of the Empire graphic novel trilogy, which once again I haven't read. Largely, largely because I don't feel like going back. The only version of Korra I feel like going back to is the one we constructed. <laughs> um, yeah. But something I find a bit odd is the last sentence where it says, quote, Play in Korra's era if you want to deal with the repercussions of imperialism and play in a modernized era. Repercussions Reap of imperialism? Um, I don't... Yeah, the I, I I um I think they want to try and prop up all of the uh of the um straw man authoritarian fascists that were part of the actual Korra show as rabid imperialists with this statement. Except none of them were. Uh Kuvira was. K I would say Kuvira, Kuvira was. Kuvira was a fascist. Yeah. That's it. She was a she was a di she was a dyed in the wool Mussolini style fascist, but um, but Amon was was a was a radical terrorist, 
Um, Medical terrorist. Yep. Un- Unalak was a, was a zealot. Um. The, and then, of course, the Red Lotus Society were a bunch of anarchists. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Re- I don't really. If you wanted, if 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 there's a, the only two the only two countries I can I can honestly see having a rep, have the only um the only time I can I can see ra- I can see radical imperialism has to deal with the has to do with the expansionism of the Fire Nation or. Um, or the or um, the or the wars that Chin that Chin started in his attempt to unite all the unite all of the earth all the parts of the Earth Kingdom. Um, yeah. Because because Chin, because Chin was supposed to be inspired by Chin Shi Huang. Mm-hmm. Um, I I would like to uh. I I, I would like to state that um, in general. The repercussions of imperialism throughout history have been uh, a uh, a lead to generally improved societal conditions for all around. Yes, there are times where this is not true, and yes, conquering things leads to bloodshed. That's what it means to conquer. But places where imperialism was high was high in uh, in supply were generally very prosperous until the Imperials left. Let's um, also let's also not pretend that um that 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 con- that conquering is so is solely the domain of imperialists, which I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure they're trying to argue. Oh yeah, I'm bet I bet that's the argument. Definitely true. Cuz it's but, not like that didn't happen with it's not like that didn't happen with with and with any of its governmental predecessors like feudalism or even going all the way back to tribalism. But I mean the most um the most excellent example of the best and then worst outcomes of imperialism are all around one city in China. That is technically not China but also China. Hong Kong, so long as the British still had ownership of it, thrived. It was part of the British Empire up until wasn't it given back in two thousand or nineteen ninety nine somewhere around there, mm-hmm. and it thrived and it didn't want to go back, but no, because of an agreement and a, a treaty made by by the UK with China, they had to give it back, and when they gave it back, everything started getting worse and worse, and now they're stuck behind the Great Firewall, and we've lost news about them, and that was over two years ago, and I'm still fucking livid. But see, not all uh, imp- the repercussions of imperialism, in my opinion, are in most cases it's positive in the end. Um, although, although um, you, you may be you may be giving some of the writers a bit too much credit. Oh, I know the... they're they're biased because because the it's it's a very it's a very juvenile um, attitude rega- attitude regarding Im- regarding imperialism. Um. In, incident, incidentally, I am get, I am going to market get, I'm going to market against the, I'm going to market against them with the fact that they're that they're referencing of that they're trying to reference events from novel from novels and graphic novels. When I guarantee you, most of the people who are getting this probably have probably have not um, read uh, read those. They've probably their their experience is likely going to be solely focused. On the on the two animated series, um, likely. Anyway, now when it comes to the starting play section, they talk they talk about they talk about a the idea of sco- of scope, ranging from a single fire sage temple, for instance, the air nomad temples, the entirety of Bossing Se, or everywhere the seas touch. Um, then All the, of those examples being uh, from very narrow single location scopes. To rambling scopes to the scope of a giant mega city, because let's be honest here, Bossing Say is a mega city. Yeah. Not, not in the, not in the idea of the mega cities. <laughs> it's a, it's an avatar level mega city. Let's be let's be fair. And then of course, everywhere the seas touches the whole world. Mm-hmm. Um. 
Let's see. Then they mention a gr a group fo a group focus, basically basically the basically the verb, um, which is the group focus is supposed to be a problem too complicated to overcome in one one episode, something that would take an entire season. And then outline the inciting incident. They have a few examples for Act One, Act Two, Act Three. Um, I'm not. I'm. F I'm okay with. I'm okay with this as a kind of get things going approach. But do you remember? Do you remember when I said at the end of at the end of our last discussion with this, whether or not whether or not they were writing a story, whether or not they were providing a sandbox or writing a story. I feel this is like... definitely writing a story. Yeah, and that's. Hmm. There's going to be more later on in the document that shows that not only is this writing, write, not only is this writing a story, but this is writing a story via Mad Libs for one, and for two, in the most milk toast and least flavorful way possible. These are extremely generic. Uh, for for example, with group focus, to defeat villain, to protect place, idea, culture, person, thing, to change culture, society, place, person, to deliver person or thing, to place, culture, or person, to rescue person or thing, to learn idea, culture, training, or history. These that's that is so broad as to be useless. You could take that, that group focus thing, and transplant it into any other world anywhere. Mm -hmm. And do the same thing and get the same output. A problem too big to overcome in one quote-unquote episode. <laughs> yeah. Now, on paper, this kind, this kind of thing, if this, if this was a, if this was a, uh, if this was an aid that was in, say, the GM section, I would honestly be fine with that. But as a forward-facing feature, I have issues. And when I, when I say if this was in the GM section, what I want to make clear with that is if this was a tool to help, G, to help GMs um, get, an, get an idea on what, the, on what they want to do, but not necessarily be a, um, ske not necessarily be a skeleton that, that is being built around and having its own sheet... Yeah, I was I was about to say the playbooks all have an entire fucking section on this. Yeah. Um, and I know, and I know some people might say, but but what what about these? What about the setting seat that Genesis has? Why why aren't you giving that the same kind of scrutiny? Because Genesis is a universal game, so a setting sheet I think is warranted in order to in order to give players a general idea on some of the rules modifications. And what's allowed and not and not allowed in terms of what they can get. Mm -hmm. Um. But this, but this is specifically trying to go for Avatar. It's a, it has a defined setting with a defined set of rules. So it so this sort so this sort of this sort of thing is it is ill advised. And the the idea the idea of pl of going by acts, um, powered by the apocalypse is still a st is still a story centric kind of game, and I tend to I tend to run my my game sessions like their episodes anyways. Mm -hmm. But the pro but the but one of the big problems is when it comes to this. When, I'd say the um the outline the in the outline the inciting in inciting incident in a series of acts can get could very easily give the give the impression of trying to um railroad yes oh uh, that may that may be me that may be me reading too reading too much reading too much into it, but that's the that is very much the vibe that I keep getting. Um, especially considering that you only really have a few choices for each part, and it's decided by the players. <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm the this. Is something that should be decided by the by the G, by the GM. 
not mm-hmm. by, not necessarily not necessarily by the pl- by the players. Because I I know I know some people want I know some people especially in the story gaming crowd want to do this whole oh the, yeah. oh ev- oh the whole table is creating the story together. Yeah they yeah they are, but at the end of the day, someone's got to be the captain in the ship. That's what the GM is for. If you want if you if you do, if you truly want to do the whole the whole everybody's at the table f- um to get everybody's creating the story together that's what a gm list game is for powered by the apocalypse is not a gm list game yeah most games that have game masters uh, game master is intended to do a few things they act as the the rules judge mm-hmm. they, they they make sure that the established the established rules are being followed and that uh, all of the particular mechanics are working together <clears throat> they help to narrate there are many games which call a gm a narrator or storyteller mm-hmm. so they are the ones building the primary spine upon which the pcs act on the and yes pcs can in fact pull on a thread you never thought they'd pull on and pull apart whatever carefully cra- crafted plot you wanted to run them into but the hallmark of a good GM, or at least in my opinion, is that you can fucking improvise when that happens. <laughs> oh shit, they killed the guy they were supposed to talk to to get their first mission. Well, when they loot him, they find a note about a cool item in a place. And or something along those lines. If you re- if you really need out if your GM really needs outlining help when it comes to when it comes to setting up their stories, I would be far more willing to ha- to tell him to rec- to um, invest in the or- invest in the Oracle generator um, deck that Nord Games is developing, or you know, there's plenty of other like free. There are actual free resources out there that help a lot. Mm-hmm. Now. When it comes to when it comes to character creation, um, this is where this is where we got one of the things that really made that really made you tilt your head, is the choice. Now it's PBTA once again, so so the game being playbook based, I'm not I'm not opposed to. Neither am I. Um, Powered by the Apocalypse does some very good things, especially with the playbook approach. It can be adapted for some really good ideas. Yes. However, Where I... <laughs> I'm, I pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we're on the same wavelength on this, so go ahead. Where I tilt my head is that these playbooks are really generic. This is, again, the, the entire draw of this game is supposed to be you are working within the world of Avatar, The Last Airbender, or... If you liked the second show, the second show. <laughs> um, but these six playbooks that they that they present to us are you could take these anywhere. Again, it's the same problem as with with the group focus and the inciting incident definitions. These are extremely generalist uh, to the point that I could take any of these playbooks into any other universal game. I if I wanted to for some dumb and idiotic reason to want to take uh, a a playbook from this into GURPS <laughs> again dumb and idiotic reason. I could if I wanted to uh, adapt parts of GURPS to po- uh, powered by the apocalypse I could use all six of these playbooks. And, and it wouldn't come off as as uh, as strange or different or isn't this a little specific for GURPS? No, this is too general for Avatar. That's what the point is. Yeah. We should get we should get into the playbook specifically. The playbook the playbooks that they have here are the bold, the guardian, the hammer, the icon, the idealist and the successor. The bo- the the bo- the bold is supposed to be the leader, the guardian is supposed to be the protector, the hammer is supposed to be the muscle. The icon is supposed to is supposed to be the is supposed to be the um the le- the lineage ca- uh, the legacy char- the um, tradition character since it talks about coming from ancient traditions or inheriting standards the idealist is self is self explanatory 
and the successor is f supposed to be from a lin they say a lineage of powerful but sca but scary f but scary figures. So you're so you're a descendant of Fire Lord Ozai and Fire Lord Sozin. Yeah. Um <clears throat> uh but no, they don't say that. You're just from a lineage of powerful but scary characters. See, now something I'd like to point out here is we've got our typical five man band and the extra ranger. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the, these are these are these names are generic as hell. The bold is your red. He stands at the forefront. And he leads the, he leads through example, and sometimes he's a little hot headed. Um, the guardian, likely your green, hmm. uh, stands by the side, makes sure no one get hurt. I would you know, I would say the guardian's more of the yellow. Depends on which uh, Sentai series we're talking about. Yeah. Because green, green is sometimes a main a main color instead of a sixth ranger. Mm -hmm. um, the hammer is who I imagine is the yellow because I've seen a lot of yellows that are the strong men, including in uh, the Wonderful One Hundred One, which is a fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the icon is is weird. You you come from ancient tradition, and you've inherited standards to live up to. So the icon could almost be in this way mixed with the successor because if you come from a lineage of powerful but scary figures you could also those that lineage could be subject to ancient traditions with seri serious standards but clearly they're meant to be separate like one is <clears throat> icon feels like it's supposed to be an air nomad for example someone who comes from a very strict traditionalist uh monastery and successor is outright zuko it's fucking zuko just say you're Zuko. Play a Zuko. <laughs> if, if they had, if they had, and um, this this brings this brings a big or Azula. Result. You could be Azula as well, but then you'd have to also be psychotic. Have you have you seen have you seen some of the people have you seen some of the people on RPG Twitter, especially the people on D and D Twitter? Just saying. <laughs> um. But but. The big, the big problem, the big problem that I, the big problem that I have is when I look, when I look at a good, when I look at the good, at a good chunk of the playbooks that I, that I've that I've seen um, throughout my ventures with Powered by the Apocalypse, they are all significantly tied to to the set to the setting or genre or subgenre that they are intended to emulate. As much as I don't like worldwide wrestling compared to the other wrestling games that I covered for that special, its playbooks are what you would expect. There's the jobber, the aerialist, the the techni the technician, the bru the bruiser. These are all these are these they're they are char they are wrestler archetypes, but they're the archetypes that one would expect. Mm -hmm. Granted, there, granted, there's the issue they that that um. There's been a lot of wrestlers in the last few years that are that are very um, hybrid kind hybrid kind of people. Um, a jobber who's also an aerialist. Um, I was I was actually I was actually going to go with um, a fair a fair few. There's been a fair few, especially in the independence of people who are who can, who can who can equally go high flyer or um, technician. Yeah, I can see that. <clears throat> but the the point is that even with that game, which had its own failings, you've covered, mm -hmm. um, the playbooks are tied intrinsically to the to the game. They're tied intrinsically to the style. Yeah. These are these are not only terms you would expect from a wrestling game, but their kits, the playbooks themselves, have skills and etc. Mm -hmm. that are specifically tied into wrestling. Yeah. This is this is the focus of the thing. Oh. Whereas again, mm -hmm. looking at these, they're so like I said, they're so general. I could take them from here and put them anywhere else, and they could be used. They're so generalist. It's fun. It's funny you made a. It's funny you made a Super Sentai um, analog because there there was a Powered by the Apocalypse game called Henshin that was clearly emulating. Um, Super Sentai slash Power Rangers, and instead instead of trying to go for this generalist approach, it had the playbooks as the colors. 
which is perfect. If you're going to, I mean, there are some very, obviously we have the, the, the hot, fiery red and cool blue mm. comparisons. Those always, those have been a trope among Sentai, uh, since Sentai was the beginning, because that's a, an allusion to ancient yokai folk tales about the red and blue oni. Yeah. Um, but you know, you have you you have your pinks usually being the uh, the the baby face girl in many cases, or She's, or in, gen in general, just the just the compassionate type. Um, yes, but I, I mean, U Umeko comes to mind when I think pinks yeah. that are compassionate and idealistic. She would actually, I the idealist it feel, feels pink to me. That's mm -hmm. that's my thing. Um, um, but yeah, each color. It not only has tropes that are generally associated with it that you see pretty regularly. Obviously, there are those who break, break the role. Like, um, Bo Bokenger, your cool blue is actually cool black because Boken black is a badass. Mm -hmm. I am... And anyone who says otherwise, go watch Bokenger again. He fucking spins on off of the bullet of a gun of one of the boss characters. Eat shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but when it... But... The other, but I do, I do strong, I do strong, then I ended up doing a bit, this is, this is where I end up doing a bit of research bef beforehand, even more so than usual, because I, um, I wanted, I wanted to check something, and the way, the way that the, the way that these playbooks are set, are set up, is not, ex is not exactly like, like their, like their previous, um, the previous PBTA, um, work that they, they had referenced that being masks a new generation but it is very similar and i feel i can't help but wonder if the playbooks that they have here originally were originally were just ports over from mask playbooks that they that they just modified after porting if they're that similar i wouldn't be su uh, surprised especially considering how soon this uh, playtest came out after that that interview. Mm -hmm. I um, I would almost say they didn't have enough time to develop playbooks, supremely unique playbooks to the setting and the system. Um, um, even the, even though, uh, which is, which is baffling to me because because it's because um, as far as playbooks unique to this kind of to this kind of setting. There's already some. There's already some work done on that. Last time I mentioned Legend of the Elements, and it does exactly that. Change it changes the name so it do, so it's so it can be legally distinct, but still. Yeah, I am. Um... There's a there's a later sidebar. We'll get into that, mm -hmm. people. Um, but suffice to say, these playbooks are generalist. They yeah. don't seem unique or tied to setting or even tied to genre. Um, and that's the primary gripe we have with, with the, the, the offered playbooks. Yeah. Now, they sep now they separate... They, now, when it comes to their abilities... When it comes to their abilities to fight, they separate that into the... Um, into, the train into the training part of it. Yeah. And... I had I had spoken with you earlier where I where I said that as I was going through the as I was going through the mechanics of this there was something that felt off. Yeah. And, and um this is and I think this is a this is a prime point to talk about that. Bending is just a form of training. And they put they put in what they put in one of two other um archetypes of training that being weapons and technology yeah uh, and again this this will this will tie into the sidebar that we'll discuss later mm -hmm. but there's 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 no focus it's choose what your character specializes in and then choose your signature fighting style thing uh what they say there is uh, a thing about the way they fight that makes them different from other benders of the same element or other non-bending martial artists who use a similar approach. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you were to choose a water bender that uses water whips, what about using water whips is different from every other bender who water bender who uses water whips? What about your fighting style is unique and distinct? And it's like, 
Well, what? But th these are... <laughs> it's like they missed what the fuck bending was. Bending is an art is a martial art as much as any other martial art. That's the reason in Avatar The Last Airbender, every fucking bending style was based off of a real martial art. All of the little forms that everybody did for each bending style was a unique stance and type of martial art. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it is mind boggling. That they're like, I'll oh, just just uh, choose 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 the bending type, choose what you're gonna do with it, and how you're unique. That's like, but the the way you're unique with bending isn't necessarily how different your form is or how different you know your weapons are, because everybody who who practices the same type of bending you do is gonna have the same general foundation. What's unique is yes, application. But one of their examples, going to, back to waterbenders, is a waterbender who creates clubs, spears, shields, and projectiles out of ice for themselves and their non-bender companions to use. First of all, um, while we have seen waterbenders use ice weaponry, uh, it's not the... First of all, it's not the main thing they use. And, and second of all, um, I've I don't think I've ever seen them create like holdable clubs and spears. Mm -hmm. I can't. I can't think of a single time that's happened. And then the shields they build are just oh, up, up comes a wall of water that I immediately froze in place to block this thing that was coming my way. Um, that which makes sense. I mean, you, you you can control small to large amounts of water and do drastically different things with them. And there you go. Uh, most often we see. The the way a bender fights is not by the physical application, but the mental and psychological impetus behind their bending type, mm -hmm. such as water benders redirect force, much as much like water does, mm -hmm. malleable but can come crushing down like a like the undertow or like a massive storm it's it's all about the redirection of force which is also why you know water bending is primarily tai chi forms mm -hmm. um whereas something like earth bending is about uh being rooted and solid and and immovable so that the earth instead moves um and so on and so forth you know air bending is all about uh being Light on your feet, evasive, uh, strike from many angles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then of course, fire bendings are traditional Shaolin. <laughs> it's a, it's a, and it's also, it, it's also mostly about rush down, beat down. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and those are all not just tied in because of the type of m martial arts they're using, although, of course, you know, if you've ever seen a Shaolin master on any sort of documentary, you know that it's not just rush down, beat down. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a mindset tied to how each element is A, produced, and B, um, used. Especially when uh, when Iroh uh, finally helped Zuko and Aang uh, realize that firebending doesn't come from anger and hatred. It comes from a vivacious love of life. Mm. And they finally realized that when they saw the dragons dancing. Oh, that was such a good episode, too. <laughs> but uh, essentially, there's there are mindsets that cause benders to change how they use their bending. And that's how they make themselves unique, what their personal viewpoint and thinking brings to the foundation of the thought processes that lie behind their bending art. So changing it to something as simple as, oh, I create tools with ice, is A, underselling it, and B, really unimaginative. And I don't like it. I don't like it. Now, this is where I, this is where I have to compare this to Legend of the Elements, and if and the reason why I'm comparing it to why I'm bringing that up in comparison to this is 
both of them are trying to do the same thing. It's just one has the official IP license and the other one doesn't. That one had bet had benders, or as they referred to it, shapers, as uh -huh. their own playbook. Uh -huh. And right out of the gate, you were getting a you were getting a set of moves based on that based on that particular bending style instead of the, instead of this um this whole tr this whole training thing. Now, when it when it the this is where I also have to bring up masks because. In masks, your um, masks is a superhero game, and obviously trying to do all, obviously trying to do a superhero game in a rules light setup is going to have problems. But their approach to doing the su the superhero part was was you checking off a box from a list of powers on the playbook, and ju and just well you ro well you ro you roll up you roll I, th I think it was grace and fr grace and freak. When you, either Grace or Freak, when you um, when you're going to be using your superpowers, which is lame. This is the training thing isn't as lame, but still pretty lame. Um, and when it comes to when it comes to background, being able to choose between two is is nice. Um, I don't quite. I don't quite know why. Um, I don't quite know what what um, what it's what what it's going to affect when it comes to the actual stat end of things. Um, it, just, it just says, uh, "Your background affects social situation," and tells us what kind of knowledge and practice you might draw on when you rely on your skills and training, which is in bold and italics, and they never detail what it means. See, then they then they have the whole thing with demeanors, which they don't mention. Um, the the uh, history questions, which might be might be useful for helping get someone's idea out, but not a whole lot beyond that. Um, then we get to the stats, which work the same, which work, which um, no matter no matter what PBTA game you're using, the the stats are the stats are going to work exact uh, exactly the same no matter what. Uh -huh. It's just in this case they are creativity, focus, harmony, and passion. Um, you have the, f you have you have the, now. Um, this is where we get to another thing that is veering a little bit too closely to mask. Um, now the fatigue track, perfectly fine with that. You mark you mark fat you mark fatigue you mark fatigue when you're fa when you're ex when you're exhausted or injured. Um, Condi then they bring up the conditions thing, and the conditions. This is ripped straight from masks, word for word. It is same set of conditions in masks as it as in Avatar Legends. Wow. And I don't. I don't care. I don't care for the for this condition setup for two reasons. One, when I think of conditions. I'm thinking of a debuff from some from from a specific effect. I'm pretty sure you are too. Yeah, when I think condition, I think status. I think like when I hear condition, the very first thing that came to mind was, "Oh, you fell asleep in the middle of battle because someone cast sleep on you." Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're thinking status conditions, status effects. But the way condition is written out, and the and the fact that it feels like another form of a damage track well it, uh, it it's a uh, it is a second damage track it outright is but uh, i can't fault it for being a damage a second damage track cuz uh for example Shadowrun has two damage tracks. Uh, and one does affect the other. Mm -hmm. uh, but... The... The thing I dislike about, about conditions is... It's, it's, a it's, a, it's a derivative of a, der of, of a derivative. Because the fatigue is derived from doing stuff in the game something like performing actions having a fight whatever 
conditions are then attached to you once you've marked all five of your fatigue boxes and have to mark another. Once you've marked all five fatigue boxes and you have to mark a sixth, you clear the five fatigue boxes and mark your first condition. And then there are the five conditions, afraid, angry, foolish, guilty, and insecure, which uh, the way they work is it's like a damage track that gives you negative bonuses to certain types of rolls depending on the damage you've taken. Mm-hmm. Uh this gives you negative two penalties to specific, uh, some of the the moves, simple moves as they call them in the game. Um, and then, of course, it says here in under conditions, if you've already marked all five conditions and you must mark another, you're taken out. You become unconscious, injured, distraught, or trapped. Your actions can't trigger moves or affect the scene anymore. You're at the mercy of the other characters in the scene and might be disarmed, captured, or otherwise limited. It's not until after the scene ends that you recover, after you've had some time off or your opposition frees you. When you recover, clear all marked fatigue, but keep all your conditions marked. So, you, you, you can't even die. You can't even die! I... Mm. We'll get... Then, we'll get when, it comes to the, when it comes to the die thing, we will... Um... We will get. We will get to that. wasn't Wasn't that a Wasn't that a, a Wasn't that a criticism I had when we started reading about stuff in the original article too? That it sounded like they were going to make it a game that where you really couldn't really have a lose state. I believe so. If not, that's my criticism now. That's one of my criticisms now. It doesn't seem like there's really a lose state. Just a, this changes your situation now, state. Mm-hmm. So now we get to something I feel is stupid. Mm, I don't like the balance track. So we, I think we should, I think we should explain the what the balance track is supposed to be accord, according to what we have here before we rip into it. Okay, so. Every playbook has two polar principles that it values. Um, If we, for example, let me go all the way down to the bold because he's the first example in almost all the examples in the playbook. Anyway, um, if, if you look at the Teak the Bold pregen, Mm -hmm. His balance is between loyalty and confidence, which, if you're if you're looking at it, it they mean loyalty to the party and confidence in himself. And this balance track is is supposed to measure how close he is to one to one. Uh, principle or the other and where along this track he is centered. So so this, this balance track has actually two inbuilt tracks. It has a more permanent, less, uh, less fluctuating version called the center. And that is um, it starts from what I could tell in the center at zero. And the only time it's, it's affected to move one way or the other is when you lose your balance on one end or, or, of the scale or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the balance itself is a constantly fluctuating uh, secondary form of the center that you mark and only move briefly, and then you probably have a uh, like a counter or something on your on your actual uh, sheet, or maybe you just you know hi- you have a pencil and you move it up and down on top of this little uh, scale for how close to your balance being shifted in one direction or another you are. Um, And as you shift balance, it gives you bonuses to the principle you're moving closer to, but then deficits from the principle you're moving away from. It's a cool idea. I mean, don't get me wrong. But it feels extreme... Again, 
this is going to go back to my, my one of the primary things I, I ran into this in reading this entire document, or at least skimming it. Everything feels very generic, like they couldn't commit. Um, and so, like, th this balance, I understand the, the idea of achieving balance, because even Aang was told that he would have to achieve balance. I mean, hell, just before the final fight when he was with the, with the monk who was trying to help him restore his avatar state, uh, he's like, nope, you have to leave Katara behind. And it's very clear that Aang did not do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the balance, that he, he, couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't have his emotions so wildly in sway anymore. He had to take control of himself and do things in a, in a thought, thoughtful fashion, which... Mm -hmm. I'm going to note isn't exactly balanced. That's that's more of a different personality of austerity, but uh, we'll, we won't get into that. Yeah, that's a different criticism entirely. Mm -hmm. But the way the way this works is they they say here at the start of play, your balance and your center are both at the middle of the track, and then your balance shifts regularly throughout the game, and the center represents your default which you return to when you're not under duress or pressure. Um, your center may actually change over the course of the game, but it rarely happens. And we'll get into that in more detail later. Um, so, uh, as I said, as you move away from one principle, you get deficits, but you get benefits from the principle you're moving towards. And the, bo the bonuses are uh, reflective opposites. So if you have plus two on one, you have minus two on the other. Mm -hmm. um, it's meant to be sort of a, uh, it's, it feels like it's meant to be a, um, a narrative assistance system in some ways. Like to help you determine how your character is going to act in a specific situation. And if you act in accordance with that with that principle in that situation, you know, good things can happen, etc. Uh, but to me, it feels like a really poorly implemented alignment system, almost. Yeah, that that's the that's the that's one of the big that's one of the big things that I ended up I ended up thinking of. Um, now, grant now granted, unlike unlike the nine alignment system that that everybody's familiar with. Um, this one, it this one is is a little bit more freeform because they don't because they don't have a hard and fast. I don't think they have a hard and fast list of what the um, what the opposing principles should be. The big the big prop the big problem I'd say is the is the fact that you're you're um you're putting you're putting an assumption on the on the characters that the, that that they're it that. This be that they're gonna be that they're going to be struggling with this inner conflict between between two extremes. When re when really while the, while um while the while that cert while that certainly it while that while that certainly was a factor with several characters throughout throughout the series, not in the way that they're attempting here. Um. Eh. For example, Aang had the balance between the whole the whole thing of being the avatar and seeing the bigger picture with the fact that he just that he wanted to be someone of his own age. Um, Basically, yeah. Um, Kata in it's re it really it now grant obviously obviously when it comes to the whole going between two extremes, the big example for this kind of thing is Zuko, but um. Katara? I think, I think there's one bigger example than Zuko, actually. Who? Who? Sokka. His constant feelings of uh, of of in of inferiority to the benders of the party reflect that he has both. He wants to be confident in himself, but he also wants to bear responsibility for the people around him because he's supposed to be a warrior. He's supposed to protect them, not the other way around. And 
on paper that those kind those kind of those kind of conflicts that is that is perfectly fine but the the way that the way that it's used in practice with the balance track for this they wa they want each extreme to be to be um, um to be kind of like you said a lot like you said broad al broad alignment setups i really <laughs> think that the opposing principles should instead of instead of having a one word descriptor should be something like a a short sentence that the player has to write out yeah like in the ki in the ki in the case of, in the case of Sokka, for on one end he should be on one end he should be writing i'm a i'm a warrior of the of the southern water tribe and on the other on the other end he should be he should be writing i'm 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 the i'm the one normal in a room full of benders yeah and to uh i'd, I'd actually like to point out going back a little bit mm -hmm. that they um they they take into account the non-benders almost um i guess i guess it's it's a it's such a nonchalant oh yeah there's also you know weapon users and and technology users along with like it's it's treated just as non important as bending was um because they there's there's a point they 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 aren't addressing and that's non benders make up a large part of society yes like they they uh, they the nonchalance with what they're with which they're treating everything here almost implies that either everybody is a bender that knows how to fight or or everybody that isn't a bender also knows how to fight which isn't realistic i mean well isn't believable excuse me let me let me rephrase mm -hmm. it isn't believable there is no authenticity behind that if you're in a living breathing world there are going to be people who don't know how to fight yes your party needs to know how to fight for you know the reasons of there are combat statistics and combat encounters in this game but you could take into account that maybe there are people who don't know how to fight and if you have a party member who isn't say formally trained like all of the benders are going to be somewhat formally trained because bending has forms bending has schools but a weapon user maybe just some farm kid who chased off uh you know um bandits and uh scavenging uh wildlife with the the chop the wood chopping axe he has maybe that is what this bold character maybe he's a non-bender who's a weapon user and he uses axes but he's not trained he just knows how to swing his axe at things because they came at him and so you could you could actually oh my gosh i'm no we're, we're not here to improve it we're just here to judge it god mm -hmm. i mean we might be here to improve it a little bit but fuck this is Ash's fault. I blame Ash for this. <laughs> looking at looking at narrative hooks and going, no, there's there's more to this. I blame Ash, and I'm sure he would be so happy to hear that. <laughs> but there's a there's an almost uh, irreverent. There's the word I'm looking for. There's an almost irreverent way they deal with everything in this game. As if, oh yeah, it's got all the trappings. That's all you guys care about, right? And I'm yeah. my skim, my skim. There were inklings of that, but now that we're digging into certain mechanics a little deeper, I'm just like, ah. Yeah. How does this imply the world? None of this implies the world. That's the other thing. I get the. F because of the f because of the fact that there's that cr that there's that crawl about b about bring about the avatar bringing balance to the world, I feel like somebody decided to double di to double down on that without understanding that ba that um even the sh even the show itself has a lot of debate about what is ba what is balance. Hell, that was that was the whole that was the whole conflict when it came to the promise. Not only, not only that. Um, that was the the whole conflict when it came to uh, every avatar prior to Aang telling him you're gonna have to kill Ozai, mm -hmm. which energy bending is a cop out. I will admit that entirely. But goddamn, was it cool? 
It's a justified cop-out from Rule of Cool. I'll keep it. You live this day, energy bending. <laughs> but beyond that, they've even taken this what looks to be a fast and loose alignment system and turned it into a combat mechanic with the moment of balance. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, essentially, moment of balance is, is a thing that you have to unlock for character advancement. So it has to be, you can't get it at base character gen. You have to go through at least one advancement. And you can only use it anytime your balance matches your center. Now, as they stated, your balance and center at the very beginning of play are zero and zero. Mm -hmm. But the center can shift depending on if you ever fall out of balance. And again, we'll get into the details of that later. Um, so if you're, let's say, uh, using Teak again between loyalty and confidence, let's say he, his center has moved towards confidence, so he's actually his center is now plus one confidence, minus one uh, loyalty. You would have to match plus one confidence, minus one loyalty with your balance on top of your center to use the moment of balance. And the moment of balance is described as a trump card that resolves the scene and situation as described by the moment of balance um, feature on the playbook. And so first of all, it's a it's a um, winner takes all you 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 uh, you resolve the scene. That seems a little. I don't like it. Like it should, maybe it should resolve a conflict within the scene, but not the scene itself. And again, it's 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 one of the it's one of those. I'm actually I'm actually reminded of actually I know what I'm I know what I'm reminded of, and it ju it just hit it just hit me as you're going as you're going through this kind of thing. Does this not feel like the worst interpretations of Exalted's virtues? Oh my god. Am I wrong? You're not. You're not. How could you get Exalted this wrong? Exalted was heavily inspired by... But I'm not going to say directly, but they cer but they certainly um, they certainly were will were willing to say were willing to say yeah we took yeah we took some from Avatar. Exalted so the the Solar Exalted are actual Wuxia characters. The Solar Exalted are Wuxia characters. Let's let's be perfectly honest here. The Solar Exalted are outright Wuxia. Mm -hmm. Or even Shenshi, because you are demigods. Um, <clears throat> the, the moment... Uh, I just... I'm going to work myself up if I don't stop now. i got to stop now. I'm going to stop now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now... The, now, um... Then, now, of course, there's the whole... There's the whole whole thing with combat technique which every playbook is supposed to have um it feels it feels like maybe it's just me but in, at times does it feel like they want to downplay the their own combat mechanics for the for, for the purposes of must story i mean they did say they wanted to make this a very narrativist romp through the avatar world um well, and the, they downplay it, but then you look at this the the character sheets and you realize, oh, they've given you one combat technique fully pre-built for free, and then left the rest for you to figure out with very little guidance on how to figure that out. Like, it literally says, uh, in the full game, you can either choose to take your playbook special combat technique or a special combat technique based on your favored fighting style, water, earth, fire, air, hand-to-hand -hand combat, or combat technology. There will be a list of such techniques in future versions of the game. For now, just stick to your playbook special technique. Yeah. What? What? 
which has that which has that vibe of of each of just the... do do what we tell you and you'll have fun. No, this playtest document mm -hmm. seems like it's geared entirely to people who may have never played a TRPG before. And I um. I want to make I want to make something clear. I have no I have no problem with that on paper. On paper, it's fine. But play tests are going to be primarily in the hands of game veterans. There's also the, there's also one other thing. Just because you're tr just because you're trying to go fam just because you're trying to go family friendly does not give you the excuse to condescend. Yes, the patronization and condescension is entirely unnecessary. And in fact, makes your product look infinitely worse. If you if they had said there will be a list of such techniques in future versions of this game, for now we offer the playbook special technique for use. Mm -hmm. That one rephrasing would have made it seem like, oh yeah, you can't provide the full exhaustive list. You may not have even written the full exhaustive list. But you've provided one such technique for us to play around with. Cool. No, this is... No, 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 little boy. We'll have a list later on. But uh, just just use this one for now. Just use this one for now. It, yeah. it, there's an entirely different feel to those things. Mm -hmm. Now, <sighs> as far... When it comes to when it comes to things like when it comes to things like growth que growth questions as well as the way as well as the way the balance was set up, um, I feel I feel like this is what, I'm not angry about this kind of thing, but I am kind of confused as to as to what they're trying to do because they clear they clearly want people they clearly want a degree of introspection, but once the, once the thing is at someone's table. What kind of story you want the players to be telling is out of your hands. This is why I was. This is why I had such a massive stick up my ass about whether about whether or not this game this game is trying to do this game is trying to do a a um sandbox or not. Because if you want if you true if you truly want a specific kind of narrative that people are going to be playing. You don't have a role-playing game anymore. You have a story game. I am not a. I am no fan of story games. I have made that. I've made that clear many times over the years. Mm -hmm. However, a story story games in their own niche have can be right done to, correctly. Yeah, they can be done correctly, and they do have a right to exist. Um, I'm not. I'm am si simply saying that I'm simply saying that story ga that story games are no better or worse than role playing games. They're just different. And trying to trying to act like one is better because it has more of the story, um, or trying to or trying to overemphasize story in your role playing game does you no favors. Mm hmm. And uh, for some context, the the growth questions are meant to be a way to advance your character's playbook. So this is this is the way you level up essentially, mm -hmm. and for context, there are the three questions all party members are asked by the GM at the end of a session, and those questions are: one, did you learn something challenging, exciting, or complicated about the world? Uh, first of all, that's an extremely subjective question. What's challenging, exciting, or complicated to one person may not be challenging, exciting, or complicated to another. There may be a person who never checks this question because they're like, no, I, I, I'm a big fan of Avatar. I already knew all that. But that could be a completely, um, a completely relevant and valid experience for someone who's a big Avatar fan. That, they, that, that first question never gets checked because they know about the world. Because they know about the setting. Because they know about the stories. <clears throat> Question two. Did you stop a dangerous threat or solve a community problem? That's an objective question. That's something you can measure. And if one person in the party says yes, it's very likely the whole party is going to say yes. 
Mm -hmm. Granted, there are there may be situations where the whole party is not present for whatever reason, whether they've reached the end of their fatigue and condition tracks or what have you. But if one person answers this question, yes, very likely everyone's going to answer this question. Yes. And then question three, did you guide a companion towards balance or end the session at your center? Now, guiding a companion towards balance has to do with the connections system, which I still don't i i don't understand how that's going to come into play i don't i i looked at it and went huh but the other one did you end your session at your center that's again an objective measure mm -hmm. um so these three questions seem to be question one is subjective question two is objective and question three is both then they mention that in the growth section that each playbook has its own personal question that only the character answers um and again looking at our example character of teak let me get to him again just bookmark him to move to him as fast as possible mm -hmm. um where is that question i do what what did there's supposed to be a question Where's the question? Is it just on the actual... Um, I think... I think it's on... Oh, here it is. It's on the It's on the actual playbooks rather than yeah. the, the, the pre-gens. Which um, is is something... That, whole, that, that particular setup is something that's also taken very much from um, masks. Mm-hmm. So, using the bold. So, I'm looking at the bold playbook. The growth question personal to the bold, so the, the, the bold specific question, did you express vulnerability by admitting you were wrong or that you should have listened to someone you ignored? That's, again, an objective measure. So they have this mix of subjective and objective that I don't like. Make the questions entirely objective. That way there's no ambiguity when someone answers yes or no. Make it an objective measure, and they can always go, yeah, I did that, or no, I did not do that. And that way, you can always, you, you don't have people potentially rules lawyering or trying to argue with the GM. If the, every question asked is objective, there's no comparison. Did you stop a bad guy or help the community? That's something you can measure. That's something everybody will at the table will see. Yes, we did. No, we didn't. Did you end your game at center? You can see that on your character sheet. That's right there. You are tracking it. The GM's likely tracking it too if they're semi-details uh, uh, oriented GM. Hmm. But then... CD is me. Yeah, I... I ask for index cards with HP, AC, and uh, and per, uh, passive rolls on it, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it, it's it, that's an objective question, and then of course, uh, for, again from the bold, uh, did you express vulnerability by admitting you were wrong? That's something that everybody will hear you say at the table as part of roleplay, or that you should have listened to someone you ignored. Again. Somebody, something everybody will hear you role play. Um, if we look at another character uh, playbook, let's say the hammer, because I, I like the idea of the hammer. The hammer is a fun name. Mm -hmm. Growth question: Did you make progress towards your goal against your adversary? So hammers have a adversary that they uh, that is one of their focuses. They they they. The feature says, bringing them down. You have an adversary, one who represents the things you're trying to smash through. Tyranny, inequality, war. Oh, boy. Larger and more dangerous concepts that, to you at least, this one person embodies. Your adversary is someone significant and powerful, someone who actually deserves the amount of force you can bring to bear. Uh, choose a goal you have for your adversary, whether it's to capture, discredit, depose, restrain, expose, or exile them. Um, and then you get a, a negative one to 
plead with, trick, or comfort or support your adversaries. Um, and moving towards your goal against your adversary, progress towards your goal, you can, in fact, measure that objectively. There is a way. Let's say we'll use Aang and Ozai. Mm -hmm. Because it's very clear Ozai is Aang's adversary. <laughs> Every time he learned a new bending form, that would have been a step towards the goal. Every time he helped the water tribe to fight them or helped you know, the Earth Tribe, or stopped the tanks at Bossing Se and all that fun stuff, that's another goal. Those are all goals towards bringing down Ozai. Every time he told uh, Sokka or Katara or Zuko, yo, I need you to go do this thing, or hey, could you help me do this thing? And they went and, got, went, went and did said thing, such as Sokka bringing down a fucking airship fleet, go Sokka! Um, I, I still... It's still, I still laugh my ass off that, that 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 old trick worked. It was the best thing ever. <laughs> but essentially, um, at any time, he would have convinced others to help further his own goals. That's some, that, that is moving towards the goal of, of opposing your adversary. That's objectively measurable. Um, and then finally, if we go down to the idealist, because I want to see Katara before she gets real. Um, did you improve the lives of a community of average citizens? Objectively measurable from anything as small as, oh, yeah, I gave them a bunch of fruit because they were all fucking starving to, oh, yeah, I cleaned their aqueduct. So now they have clean water again. Mm -hmm. Those are all objectively measurable standards so the two so the, the what the first the very first question in the in the whole did you learn something complicated exciting or dangerous about the world mm -hmm. that that's way too uh vague and subjective that's that like what do you constitute as uh you know, complicated or exciting or or dangerous, and was it something you already knew since you're a fan of the series or whatever? Mm -hmm. There, yeah. get rid of that question entirely. Just get rid of that question and replace it with something objective, mm -hmm. and then guiding a companion towards balance. Um, because I don't understand very well the companion connections system here, uh, I would say. Make it more definite what that means. Give us a, what does it mean to guide someone towards balance? If you have that in black and white, you make it an objective standard, and you can then measure it. So growth is going to be haphazard for people. Some people who are taking the game seriously enough to answer these questions in a non-flippant manner may only advance once every few sessions. Like, because because you have to you have to check at least three of four questions to advance, mm -hmm. and it can't be the same question every time, from what I understand. And uh, well, no, maybe not. Maybe it's just three growth boxes. Yeah. So each time you answer yes to a question, you get a growth box. So if you're only ever answering yes to did you stop a dangerous threat or solve a community problem. By the way, um, if you answer yes to stopping a dangerous threat or solving a community problem, you'd automatically also answer yes to the idealist's uh, growth question about significantly improving a community of average citizens. Because that's that does tie in. <laughs> um, there are going to be people who are advancing every session because they'll either answer all three, yes, all three to the growth and advancement uh, questions, or they'll answer yes to two of them, and then one to their, their question on their on their playbook. And then there are going to be people who are advancing once every two or three sessions. Because they only answer yes to one question, or maybe two. Mm -hmm. It's it's going... If you make it objective, people should be advancing at roughly the same rates then. 
and you don't want the since this game does seem to be designed around the ensemble cast you don't want anyone growing too far ahead because if they grow too far ahead they're going to start overbalancing everything towards them and that eventually makes it unfun for other players mm. <sighs> now um the like we like we said earlier the what a, the what about bent the what about bending thing is where is where we definitely took issue um when it comes to now that what i find what i find kind of amusing is um is they end up bring they end up bringing up talking about balance twice first in that opening section and then in the playing the game thing seems kind of redundant um yeah i would i would just put that all in the same section so you have all the mechanics together as well yeah the f the five con the five conditions that they bring up afraid angry foolish guilty insecure word for word exactly in ma exactly in masks yeah there and then a few changes because one of them is about re about shift about shifting balance but but the wor but um the word but the actual words same it's yeah st there's still there's still a collection of mi of minus twos to spe to specific things um yeah and then just to quickly address that sidebar um the what about bending sidebar essentially says bending's not really that special. It's just a tool. It, the, the, and again, it's this is said in a very condescending way. Um, that, first of all, in Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra, most of the heroes are benders capable of amazing feats. The ones who aren't benders are often incredible masters of weapons or technology that rival bending itself, holding their own against capable benders in tough situations and sometimes even triumphing. Okay, yeah, the heroes have that. And if you're going to say that the party should be consisting of people who are along those heroic lines, sure. But regarding of their bending prowess or other fantastic abilities, the stories of Avatar Legends characters aren't really about their bending. Instead, the characters use their bending to go on adventures in service of the broader story, finding the role they have to fill in the world, exploring the drive inside their heart that moves them, caring for the people in their lives that matter. And there they missed the central crux of Avatar The Last Airbender. As I mentioned when we were talking about bending earlier, each of them has their own philosophy and mentality. How you treat the world, how you find your place within it, the drive in your heart, the way you care for people is tied to the philosophy you learn from your bending. Saying the story is not about the hero's bending, especially in Avatar The Last Airbender, where it quite literally is in the title and in the fucking opening scrawl where we have to take him around the world to learn all the other bending styles to in order to rest restore balance and stop the fire nation that story is literally about the fucking bending <laughs> um, literally I just say that the stories already, are not about bending i can already i can already hear some people's remarks some people's remarks in defense say saying well what about the way bending is treated in legend of korra well the way they treated bending in Legend of Korra sucks. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be flat out honest. Go watch our reconstruction, assholes. That's what I have to say. They treat bending like MMA with powers. Gone are the animations of the of the fucking various styles of of martial arts, and it's all just let's brawl with fire or our fists or and. I will give I will give SF Debris some credit for trying to defend it because because of because of a th of a attempted theme of the old ways giving way for something new. Um, the problem is there isn't really something new. If it was if it was new if it was new new um, new st new styles and approaches to bending, then there may be there may be an argument. Um, but that but but again. If you're get if you're gonna t if if it's get if it's gonna be that then you have to ha actually have something new. Um, now when it comes to when it comes to the basic moves, there's not really a whole lot. 
a whole lot to talk about. Um, when it comes to combat moves, the do, having it focused on on th on three types of techniques, and that that being defend and respond, advance and attack, and evade and observe, is a cute attempt to replicate the fact that um, combat in Avatar is a choreographed dance. However, however, a bit one. However, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the rule the rule set that they have for for bending, um, an ish a if there's one issue that if there's one issue that I think we ha I think we have is the fact that. There's not really any change. There's not really any change to how to um how it work how it works compared to other moves. You'd think, especially especially since everything seems to be based around this three tier setup that they have, that almost almost makes me think. Okay, are you trying to do feats or are you not trying to do feats? This is the description of bending. Later on down in page uh, looks like twenty one. Any playbook can have any kind of bending by picking it under training during character creation. Bending is a constant part of how you act and solve problems. Yes, which is why the story is about your bending! Mm -hmm. It's always available to you. And when you rely on your skills and training, or push your luck, or advance and attack, etc., you're likely using your bending. Yes! Yes! Which is why your bending is super important, not something to just irreverently throw on the fucking pile! That said, no character can have more than one type of bending. Having bending as your training means you use it capably. You may still have plenty to learn, yes, but you do all of the basics fairly consistently. No, Fucking, um, Nicolas Cage, you don't say mean. If if it if it really is the case where you where you understand the basics consistently, then ponder then ponder that I'd like to ponder this. It's a case where I I can I can break out my Samuel L. Jackson and say, well, allow me to retort. If <laughs> that is true, if that is truly the case, then why it why is it that the that the sample characters in in the book, in the book, only have one, only ha that can that can do bending. Only have one, only have one um, one mo one fighting move that t that ties into bending. I'll I'll use um I'll use Shaipan the I the icon. Okay. Who is who's whose training is earthbending. Their fighting style is referred to as dancing with the earth, but as far as I'm concerned, the fighting style entry means nothing. Exactly. Um, the only fighting technique that they have is wall of perfection, which is a defend and respond action. Which means it resolves first in the action economy, which we'll mm -hmm. get into. Yeah. But... When... But... Uh, but if there's... If, but if... This is this is where this is where the um resolute resolution ap approach is is something I is something I feel that that should be mentioned. I just need to find where it was. Okay, so you have basic techniques which operates under the standard model. You need a set. You need a seven or nine to get a basic hit. Ten or plus is a full hit. Any anything less is a fail. Standard PBTA fair. Yes. Now. A special t now for special techniques that you have them in three tiers. Learned, where you can learn, you can use one learned technique if you get a ten plus on your combat approach, but you have to mark you have to mark fa one um, fatigue. Um, when you've a when you've actually used it successfully, it becomes practiced, where you can use one practice tick. You can use it if you get a ten or higher on your combat approach with no higher with no other extra cost, and mastered when you fulfill the quest for mastery set to you by your teacher. Each is special and you can use one master technique if you get a 7 through 9 on your combat approach or two master techniques if you get a 10 plus. Um when 
I get the I get the feeling that what they want is that at higher levels you're able to be more freeform when it comes to the techniques, but I don't understand why that couldn't be why that couldn't be baked in. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned Legend of the Elements. Each of the moves has one of the way that they did it is that if you're if you say an Earth Shaper, you'll have a set of Earth Shaper moves. When you use one of them, you ro you roll. If it's a hit, you get to pick one of the one of the effects that that move has. If you get if you get a full hit, then you can use multiple moves in the in that setup. That at, at the very least that makes sense. And there's there's one other there's one other thing that this that this particular approach has because of the because of how they want to separate bending from weapon use hasn't really addressed. And that is people who do both. We've seen plenty of earthbenders who use hammers. Yep. Zuko used pa used paired sabers. Yep. Aang uses a glider staff. Yes. And and, uh, and Katara actually carries her water with her. Yes. But I specifically, but that one, that one, you that one you can that one's a little a little bit arguable. But the, but those main ones that I brought up are specifically for, are specifically on the matter of of using weapons and using bending. Now, I know there's I know there's probably going to be the argument that that would fall under fighting style. I do I um I don't agree with that. I do I do feel I do feel that if that there should be a significant difference from someone who's using um, firebending and, and sabers and someone who is just using straight firebending. On top, on top of that, um, there are going to be other people who argue, well, then just bake that into some special techniques. Uh, how about no? Because if somebody is both a saber fighter and a fire uh, firebender, in the case of Zuko, Zuko was not at all untrained in those sabers. In fact, he was a fucking master to the point that he could take out trained firebender army members without using his firebending with just the sabers. Mm -hmm. this, it, it, so it is very clear he is both a master firebender and a master saber dueler. Yeah. It is very clear that he can use both in tandem. So... The real question then becomes, is that two different combat, like, sources at that point? Yeah, th I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they did not, I'm pretty sure they did not, they did not, um, they did not, cons they did not consider any sort of... Secondary training. You, 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 this could literally be resolved by saying there's here's a special uh, set of uh, rules for if you want to have two types of training. That that is one way they could resolve it fairly easily. In fact, um, because you could argue that while Zuko is both a master sab saber uh, dueler and a master firebender, it's very clear firebending is his first passion. Yeah. So he's likely better at that one than he is at sabers, though. Mm -hmm. It's inconsequential when he's facing a bunch of mooks. Yeah, <laughs> um, I get the feeling that in the full book for e for each of these for each of these trainings, there's gonna be there's gonna be like a f a couple pages worth of in worth of individual techniques. I feel mm -hmm. and um, if you want if you wanted to go for if you wanted to go for simplistic because you're using PBTA, that feels a little um counterproductive. And it feels like this would that you'd end up solving a lot of problems if you just made if you just made bending and weapon and just made those trainings the playbooks of the story. Exactly. Or, or even do half and half. There's plenty. There's plenty of uh, there's there's plenty of um, PBTA books that have a half and half approach. You know one. There. Yep. If you really, if you really want to keep your character archetype, have that be have that be one half, and have all of its moves be narrative, and have the other ha and have the other half specifically for the combat end of things. And of course, mm -hmm. you can of course you can have parts that bl that blend that blend in either side. But at the ver at the very least, that's a way for pe that's a way to give people some degree of customization without over without overcomplicating it. Mm-hmm. 
now the go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say, um, going back to the entry about bending under under the the just above growth and advancement, um, and you know you can use it fairly consistently. They then say use the moves and their triggers to dictate when you go to the dice. If you're water bending some water to make fun shapes to delight a kid, you might be comforting or supporting. If you're water bending to create a flashy distraction, you might be tricking an NPC. So, not only have they treated bending as irreverently as possible, they have relegated all bending, and in fact, all uses of your bending and or non-bending techniques. Uh, to complete 100% theater of the mind. Oh yeah, you're waterbending shapes. Roll for comfort or support. Again, it's 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 so generic that I could just as easily take this to um, <laughs> a modern day setting. Oh yeah, you're blowing bubbles. Roll for comfort or support. Oh yeah, you're blowing bubbles that if they get hot enough will explode. Roll tricking an NPC. Mm -hmm. it, it's so stupid because we all know that bending is it's the primary drive of the fucking world. It's the primary drive of the setting. Yeah. This is the this is the reason why I know I I know I've talked about the um about wi about wizards being being over being um overrepresented when it comes to fa when it comes to a lot of um fantasy games. Mhm. Mm and the, and there's the whole thing of the Jedi being the alpha class as Ralph Koster put it for as his reason why he didn't want to put them in Star Wars Galaxies. Mhm. Mm but the but the thing is those part those particular archetypes are are meant are meant to be are meant to be in their own little um bubble. They're meant to... wizards wizards and and Jedi are meant to be rare, mm -hmm. are meant to be secluded. They're meant to be a like you said, his own little bubble, separate entity. Mm -hmm. They're not the crux and cornerstone of the setting they're in, but they are a significant piece of it. Benders are the crux and cornerstone. Mm -hmm. If if we want a proper comparison, benders would be your fighters, your clerics, your paladins, your rangers, your rogues, your bards. The avatar would be your wizard or sorcerer, or in this case, specifically, your wizard. The big bad guy who has all the spells. Mm -hmm. And by bad guy, I mean like badass. So, the comparison, if these guys were having the same thought of, oh, too much wizard representation, too much Jedi representation, gotta play down bending and benders so that nobody feels like, you know, pigeonholing that, it's, the, it's an incorrect comparison. I'd say this, I'd say this also, this also, this also puts a certain, um, a certain, st a, a certain tinge, for lack of a better term. On the reasoning in that dice breaker article that they gave for why they did not want to add the avatar as playable, their reasoning at the time, if you recall, was some things should remain mysterious and and unt untouchable slash unreachable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some some things should are are better left outside of player control. Which bring, which, which br brings me to which. I, which at the time I had said you're you're arguing, you're arguing on the idea that anyone who's playing this game is going to play as canon. Mm -hmm. Now that I have a bit of an understanding of how of how the tech of how techniques work, first off, it's something. Is it something that I could easily hack? Yes. However, however, the 
the big the big the big issue is I is I think I think that because of the way bending works in this, um, they didn't want they didn't want to think about the implications of an avatar character in an alternate timeline. That, or they just didn't know how to resolve it. Everybody only has one training. If you're the avatar, you have four trainings. Um. Maybe it's just me, but I feel I feel like do, I feel like that whole you on, you only have you only have one training thing causes more problems than it solves. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a pigeonhole. Yeah, I get the I get the idea. The it seems like the idea for that is to do classes, but the problem is when you try and apply a when you try and apply a class system that stringently to the, to this particular setting. You're going mm. to end up with problems. Mm -hmm. I know, now, Grant. Now, yes. Did did the Avatar adaptations using D, using D and D and the and other class based games also also use a class setup? Yes. Well, they're class based games. That's why this is a playbook game. This is not the same. There, but even even within those, like I'll use I'll use each D and D edition of of Ava, of Avatar that I ha that I have run. Which is main, which is mainly the three, the three point five and four E versions. There's a fifth edition that version that exists that a fan made, but I haven't run that. I only have it. Um, within that, within that, I'll use the fourth edition one specifically for that. Okay. Within the bent, within the bending classes. That's the, you can still you can still ha you can still ha first off. You still have the rules for multiclassing, so you still have the possibility of multiclass feats. Mm -hmm. So if you if you want to if you want to um if you want to do so if I was to do somebody like Zuk like Zuko, I would just as easily have him take a multiclass feat and then have him dip into some of the um two weapon powers from the Ranger, for instance. Yeah. Um. If I'm using the three uh, and and there's there's the there's the other thing. The entire system allows for weapon use. Yes. And further furthermore, they had there were there were adva there were advanced versions when it came to bending. There was a there was a there was a paragon path called planet bending for the really large scale stuff. Um, professional bender was a was a prestige pa was a uh, prestige. I'm sure no one took it because Cora is terrible. <laughs> um, no, the, no, the the Cora hadn't come. Cora hadn't come out yet. Oh, so this is the Boulder. Okay, got it. Yes. <laughs> then everybody took it for the memes. <laughs> um, the Boulder. I um, love the Rock XP. That was such a good XP. Yeah. Um. Now, when it come when it comes to you mentioned you mentioned that you wanted to talk about the economy of action when it comes to the basic techniques. Um, mm -hmm. where, where did you where did you want to go with that? Because I have I have my own oh. thoughts on it, but I, I'm curious about it, yours. It looks like a system of rock paper scissors, and oh. you resolve all defend and response approaches, and then all attack advance and attack approaches, and then all evade and observe approaches. Which is nice. Feels like a gimped version of the rock paper scissors set up in um, Destrega. Well, it feels like defend and respond approaches will probably beat advance and attack approaches. Mm -hmm. Advance and attack approaches, or no, well, other way around. Defend and respond approaches are probably beaten by advance and attack. Advance and attack are probably beaten by evade and observe, and evade and observe are probably beaten by defend and respond. Which, if it was a case where where it where it was it was like some old school games where everybody was deciding their act actions and then they were all resolved simultaneously. Mm. I could get be I could get behind that kind of thing, but oh, no, but I nobody's am, nobody's flipping I, nobody's flipping a face down card every round. I am I am wrong. I just read ahead. Um, your defense and respond techniques happen first, and you can either retaliate, block, or retreat. Block is specifically something to try and uh, who tries to use a specific advance and attack technique for the entire exchange. 
Um, advance and attack is strike, seizing a position, or smashing. Mm -hmm. And evading and observing uh, is testing balance, showing off, or watching a foe. Yeah. Oh. So, defend and response approaches happen first mm -hmm. in the exchange, which is uh, strange. Um, one it, one issue that I one issue that I have with this setup is is the way it interacts with fatigue. Only evade and observe uh, clears fatigue. And even and even then, it only it only clears only clears one. And, yep, whereas um, everything else inflicts fatigue. And the the big the big problem that I, one of the problems that I have with this setup is is unless I'm mistaken, um, no matter how powerful a character is, they're only going to have five marks of fatigue. Actually, only PCs. On, only PCs. NPCs. Because uh, I was looking at some of the NPCs. Um, Phylon, one of the major NPCs, has two fatigue tracks. Mm -hmm. Ten, ten blocks of fatigue. Yeah, but for for instance, somebody for instance somebody who leans heavily into that hammer archetype, you would think that they would have more stamina because they're used to being in more fights. Mm hmm. But that but that's not the case. It's the it's that whole thing of um of trying to of trying to unify everybody's everybody's health at the same level, except um. Some people are just going to be able to go longer. We've, I mean, hell, you and I, you and I are big fans of Berserk, and <laughs> and, and if a, if Guts had a fatigue track, it would be longer than the world is round, assholes. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not even go, I'm not even going into the ridiculousness with the, with um the effects of the armor. I'm talk, I'm talking about him versus a hundred men. <laughs> Saved Casca all by himself. Yeah. The guy who the guy most people say, most people are joking when they say I can do this all night. He literally did it. <laughs> um, in, in Berserk in the Band of the Hawk, it, it, during that mission, if you kill a thousand guys, you get an achievement. Mm -hmm. um, I did it. And <laughs> so did I. Um, and. Let's, but if I need to use, if I need to use a more appropriate example, let's consider Ben K. The guy who the guy who no sold getting air, getting arrows to the chest and no, and everybody was too scared of him to check. <laughs> that that and that and the fact that it, that before he before he met Yoshitsune, he was obsessed with um with win with winning a hundred swords. No, it wasn't a hundred yep. swords. It was a thousand. And and it and it was he said swords, but it was more likely to just mean you know martial weapons in general. Because mm -hmm. he had spears and other things on him too. Yeah. The point is, he would go. He would. He would get in. He would get into duels with people. He'd kick their ass and take their weapon. And then Yoshitsune beat the pants off him. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> now, when it came when it came to the. Um, the GM's role section in the in this in this quick start. There's a cup. There's a few. There's a few things that made that uh, made me tilt. Um, oh, do, do point them out. I love tilting at this game. <laughs> um, now, when it comes to agendas, this is the least offensive part. But it's things like make the world feel real, make the companion stories meaningful and important. Um, again, I. This is, again, I have to ask: Are you right? Are you trying to write a story? You're presenting a sandbox. You should be doing the latter. Um, play to find out what happens, which which sounds like a PG version of saying "fuck around and find out." <laughs> um, I don't think it has quite the negative connotation. Fuck around, fuck around and find out means though. Um, so I'm going to be honest here about this agenda, Zaria. Mm -hmm. Make the world feel real. Well, no fucking shit. It's not like the storyteller is supposed to make the story sim or anything. Make the companion stories meaningful and important. Look back at point fucking one. Play to find out what happens. If you weren't playing to find out what happens, you know what we'd call that? Writing a fucking book! 
Yeah, pretty much. Also, I, I take... I, I look at agendas and I smirk a bit just because I'm like, <laughs> which agenda are you pushing today, guys? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what else did you tilt at here? <laughs> um, that... I'd say the whole meaningful and important, which which sounds like the meaning and per, which to me ends up sounding like the meaning and purpose um, spiel spiel that I would hear from apologists a decade ago. Um, it's a cup. It's a couple. It's a couple. It's a couple of words that don't that are, ironically don't really mean anything. Um, and, there, the, and there's the fact that I am a I am a I am a DM when I'm behind the screen. I'm not. I'm not a writer. Well, and the the thing I don't think they get is that a character or a companion or anything of that nature, anything that is not a player character, is only as meaningful and important as interactions with the party allow it to be. Mm-hmm. Because if a if a party chooses not to interact, Unless the unless they're being pursued, and even then it may not be that meaningful. They'll just be like, "Oh no, I'm being pursued." Um, but unless the party chooses to make that thing, that person, that place, whatever it might be, important to what they are doing, it's never going to feel meaningful or important. The important is derived by the players and their interactions, and it's up to the DM to moderate and judge over. Cont- the contests of those interactions therein. Yes, you describe the scenes. Yes, you you play the NPCs. You 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 may even decide their personalities, etc. But it is whatever the characters do in response to all that, whatever the players do in response to all that, that then defines how meaningful and important they are to the players. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a infamous clip. I don't know if it's infamous or, or famous clip of, of, a, of a guy on a podcast talking about how he had set up the opening um, exchange for his first session on this new campaign he was starting where this uh, noble lady was getting married to this guy and the PCs were there as uh, in either invited help or, you know, vassals of, of some of the other nobility going there. And they were, and all the PCs knew each other because you know these all these people have interacted. They're all part of you know the noble structure, whether they're servants or whether they're actual nobility. Mm-hmm. And it, originally, what was supposed to happen is a very typical BBEG comes in and steals girl. But instead, uh, they knew that you know the the they one of them decided that since they're a noble, they've known this lady, and they and they go up to talk to her with the friends, mm-hmm. and a small throwaway line of. She seems a little down about the day, you know, just kind of, kind of, a little melancholy. Becomes the PCs going, wait a minute, is she unhappy with this marriage? This guy's a total tool. Should we just help her escape? And he ran with it. Mm-hmm. Her importance was as a MacGuffin. And so, and instead, her importance became a rescuee. And that was all because of, of PC interaction. And so, what other NPCs become to the party is entirely dependent on the party's interaction with that NPC. So that that second line is meaningless because it does not take into account PC interaction. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to guidelines, this is, this is where, this is where I'm starting to see some issues. (laughs) Um, Now, Describe a wondrous world with a deep history. Once again, no shit. I feel like that. I feel like that's just repeating what we said with agendas. Address the characters, not your players. Um, bullshit. Those two, those two are not mutually exclusive. I'll, I was also about to say bu- bullshit because you have to address players when you're like, you need to roll a die to do a thing. You're addressing the player at that point because rolling a die is outside. Of the game, it influences actions within the game. But you're not asking, you're not asking Teak the Bold to roll a die. Then he rolls a die in the game, and what happens? What? No, you're you're asking Teak's player, whoever that might be. Mm-hmm. Yo, I need you to roll two d six plus 
whatever bonus you've got from your from your score to trick an NPC. Go ahead. Do it. Rolls an eight, has a plus one from I think focus or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. So it's a nine. It's success. There you go, you trick the NPC. Obviously they describe it however they'd like to, because fanciful language and theater of the mind. Theater of the mind is good for a lot of things, but I think they're overusing it here. Um but you're still having to address both the characters and the players simultaneously in many cases because both are intrinsically linked. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, be your be the companion's biggest fan. No. No, 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 no. You are not meant to be a fan of anything. You are meant to be a you're meant to be a facilitator. We describe the game as a road trip. Mm -hmm. The players are a specific party of people who have paid to be on the tour bus. The tour bus is the game itself. The GM is the driver. And if you and if you don't pipe down, the GM will turn this bus around. Now, the tour bus doesn't necessarily have to just go on one one tour. There are multiple tours you can pick from. Mm-hmm. And sometimes unexpected things happen during tours. Your bus could break down. Your your tires could could go flat. There are multiple things that could happen. And all of it adds to the adventure. Um but in the event that there are other people on this bus, aka the companions slash NPCs, you are not to advocate for them over anybody else. The GM is meant to be the guy who judges things, as I've continued to say. U- ultimately, you have to remain at a certain level of impartiality when it comes to both the PCs and the NPCs. Some DMs fudge dice rolls every now and then if they, if they really like where something is going and they don't necessarily want a TPK to happen right then and there. That's fine and dandy. If it adds to everybody's enjoyment, that's part of facilitating and making judgment calls. There are some people who don't want you to make those fudges. They want the meat grinder. And you, you'll know those people as you play with them. You'll know which groups are going to be more thankful that you fudged a couple rolls because it made for an epic moment. And which groups are like, why'd you fudge that roll? My character was could have died. I would have just written up another one. They, that is all about learning to be a Gia. You are never the fan of an NPC in-game. Like, you, maybe you've designed an NPC you're a real big fan of, and the, and the players kill them. That's going to happen. But never advocate for them in the context of the game, because that's going to lead to friction. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as treat companions equally, once again, no shit. Um, remember the history of the world and characters? Um I'd say I'd say we I say we seem to be doing a better job than they are on that front. Mm-hmm. Um, emphasize lessons throughout. No. No. The lessons, no, no, no. The lessons will emphasize themselves. <laughs> if you if you want a, if you want a morale if you want a morality play, PBS is over there. <laughs> If you if you really if you really want the morality play, go go watch whatever whatever's on the Hallmark Channel this hour, or, what, or whatever's on, whatever's on whatever's on CBN right now. I don't fucking know. I'm a, a monk. I think I would call those ones immorality plays. Touche. <laughs> but whatever lessons are going to be learned by PCs and NPCs alike, they're going to be emphasized through gameplay. You as the GM do not need to emphasize those. Mm. A lesson will be learned by a character, by an NPC, because of what's happening in the game. Again, this all this all boils back down to importance being defined by both the interactions and choices of, of player characters as much as by GM guidance. Mm-hmm. Now, give NPCs fears, drives, and hopes. Once again, no shit. Um... Make make conf. Although when it comes to when it comes to that whole give NPCs fears, drives, and hopes, if there is not a sidebar in the full ge- in the full book dedicated to that, then uh, then um that's a fail. Uh-huh. Um, make conflicts moral choices. 
Mm. No. Not all conflicts are moral choices. Yeah. The, the idea... Let's let's consider th let's consider this when when um when the whole moral choice thing re really got really got big thanks to Mass Effect. If you look back if you look back at some of the quote unquote moral choices from that era, even, and once again I have to bring up Mass Effect three, some of the choices for the in the attempt of having a Paragon choice and a Renegade choice have one side or both making something really stupid. The the peak of the peak of this kind of thing was the was the moral choice when it came to um, Tachanka. Either cure the genophage and get and and potentially get and potentially get the the assistance of the of the badass Krogans who are really good at kicking ass, or agreed to agreed to a Solarian plot to sabotage the operation and get more ships. If you look at it from the pure calculus of war, which is what the game actually wants you to do, which is fucking retarded. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the pure calculus of war states that no matter what, the Solarian deal is bad. You get like 300 extra war assets or something like that. Whereas the Krogans give you like a thousand or so. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, what's the moral choice? They frame it that the moral choice is helping the Krogan, and I would actually be inclined to agree. Mm -hmm. Because the Krogan, prior to the Gen of Age, and for those who haven't played the Mass Effect games, because I know there are people out there that haven't, are a extremely fast pr uh, reproducing race that, co that basically destroyed their own world because of their drive for competition and aggression, and of how many there were, and to prove themselves in battle, etc. Uh, they got to nukes, and basically nuked themselves back into uh, a semi-stone age of sorts. Um, more of Mad Max, because it's wastelandish, but they still have some modern tech. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, when an existential threat to the galaxy appeared, called the Rachni, which were a giant insect race, as I'm sure you get from the name Rachni being the shortening of a Rachnid. <clears throat> The Solarians forcefully uplifted this not yet mature civilization to go kick ass. And then the Krogan's like, well, we kicked so much ass, you should give us more shit. And did what they did best and started kicking more ass to get more shit. Mm -hmm. um, the Solarians did not like this. The Turians did not like this. The Asari did not like this. And so they all came together and created a, a thing called the Genophage, which reduces Krogan fertility rates to one in a thousand. Literally. And this essentially destroyed Krogan's for, what was a hundred years? Nearly a century? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Krogan were not happy about that. And the Turians were the ones who executed it most. But your choice in Mass Effect 3 to cure the Genophage is the moral choice. This was something that didn't need to be inflicted upon them um, if there had been well, any way to get them to talk at negotiation tables, but they had learned that they were too good at kicking ass. Mm -hmm. Luckily, Re Rex is uh, level-headed. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the Solarians try to make it that it's, a, that it's more, more moral to keep them weak, because otherwise the Krogans will just propose another exist or, or will impose another existential threat to the galaxy a second time around. Which is not right. I mean, you can see it from... Well, you can see it from if you have Rex. And I should hope you have Rex if you're playing through Mass Effect. Mm -hmm. If you don't have Rex, what are you doing with your lives? Rex, Garrus, and Tali. If you don't have those three, what are you doing with your lives? <clears throat> um, and uh, Rex is a good leader. And he's not going to lead the Krogans on another fucking warpath across the stars. But yeah, the the, mor the moral choices were, that were given were very obvious, I think is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. And that that's all that's ultimately the that's ultimately the problem when you when you want to do the whole moral choice thing because when you're doing the, the the key with doing moral choices and the thing that a lot of writers fall into 
is if you're going to do that, you need to have a situation where either both, either there is something very wrong with both sides. You're you're you have a catch twenty two situation, or both sides have a point. Another perfect example from Mass Effect, the rumored leaked and en- original ending to ME three, mm-hmm. written up by Drew Karpishin. Where instead of this massive galaxy at war thing, it's disasters like the star at Haystrom start accelerating, Mm -hmm. and Harbinger takes you on board himself, because, you know, he's a Reaper uh, capital ship, to talk to you from out just outside of the galaxy to show you that the galaxy is deflating. The dark matter within the galaxy is being uh, consumed. And it's all because of Mass Effects and Ezo. And so the reason the Reapers harvest the galaxy every 50,000 years is to reduce organic life back to Stone Age to allow dark matter to repropagate. And then when they get to the level of Mass Effect relays again and get to a certain critical mass, they come and harvest them again. And the choice that was going to be given to Shepard is either allow the reapers to continue the harvest because otherwise it means the end of the galaxy and possibly later on the universe itself or end the reapers and never tell a single soul about what he he or she learned on board harbinger and carry that secret with him to the grave and then allow the complete collapse of the galaxy and possibly the universe a few thousand years down the line Mm -hmm. that is a morally gray choice. That is a choice where there is no good answer. It's all compromise. Either you allow this continued cycle of death and rebirth, which is a really poetic way to put a sci-fi wheel of samsara into the game, Mm -hmm. um, because that at least keeps things going until the heat death of the universe. Or you uh, destroy the source of existential threats, but now there's a new existential threat, and you're the only one who knows. And if you told anyone else, no one would believe you. Yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> why we didn't get that ending? I'm I'm so pissed. <laughs> I'm still so pissed. Yeah, me too. Um, then they say use imbalance instead of evil. Fuck you. I know you. I know you're trying. I know you're trying to to do this whole thing of of the of the European good and evil don't don't ex- don't exist in a lot of in a lot of Asian fiction. But the thing is, you you have you haven't fully committed. Well, and just not, going with just going with a word change is not enough. Not not only that, um, the idea of good and evil absolutely exists in Eastern Asia. Um, it may not be the same as the European idea of good and evil. But it doesn't have to do with balance and imbalance. Even in Buddhism and Hinduism, there are very evil gods and very evil uh, beings and very good beings. I mean, there are... uh, What about the Ashuras? The Ashuras are seen almost entirely as evil beings that do nothing but fight. Mm -hmm. And cause war and strife and mayhem. Or... Uh, or the devas, which are seen as good. I, I, there's there are so much about no, don't use evil. Evil's a Western concept. No, you fucking idiot. Evil's a universal concept. So is good. How they're represented in mythos is different between regions. Sure, but good and evil are universal because. Morality, despite what some people would argue, is actually objective at a certain point. But we won't get into an argument of objective and subjective morality. That is a completely different uh, discussion. (laughs) I would be here for hours. (laughs) Um, And then that final line, really, that one tilts me. Yeah, the the whole seek consequences besides death. Um, look, I, death look, is a consequence of things, though. I get, I get the, I get the intent, 
but tr- but um but that is woefully inadequate it seems it seems that the the in- the intent with what they're with what they're trying to go here is is um is don't is don't look don't look at say running out of fatigue or t- being taken out as the character being dead Ex- um but i feel i feel like i feel like the sole reason they're doing that is because well this is ba- this is based on this is based on a kids show this is a fa- this is a family friendly game um there's it- this there's a very famous supercut on a on youtube about avatar the last airbender <laughs> And uh, it, uh, how to say kill somebody without saying kill somebody. Uh, let me let me see if I can find that in my history real quick. But while I'm finding that, um, death is a consequence of certain things. And death, yeah. <laughs> Here it is. When you can't say kill because it's a kids show. And and uh and and the video is is also very funny because um because of the fact that they do say kill a lot in mm-hmm. Avatar. But but there... <laughs> death is a consequence. Yes, if you're fighting, you know, maybe some mooks who are only meant to be there to stop you or, you know, get in your way and they actually win, um may- maybe then it'll It'll go ahead and it will be an imprisonment or anything of that nature. Whereas a if you're facing the actual like for the using the hammer the hammer's adversary as an example, if you're facing your adversary point blank in their stronghold even, and you get your fatigue track and condition track full and finally go over that threshold to where you're, you're taken out. If your adversary is this big personal representation of war or inequality or conflict or whatever, there's every chance that because you've been a thorn in their side for so long, they will just kill you. Mm -hmm. Death is a consequence Death is death should be a consequence for for so, certain things because it's the ultimate stakes. If you don't have stakes, if you don't have that 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 risk behind conflict, your players aren't ever really going to feel challenged. Like yeah, they'll feel a little bit challenged, but if there isn't somewhere that there's a risk of permanent loss that your character is forever gone because you failed at an extremely critical moment it's going to partially cheapen the experience now there are games where death is a consequence and it's actually really hard to die because Mm -hmm. the game is designed to keep you going for a long time because it is a it is meant to be a sort of power trip parts of exalted are like that Mm -hmm. um but the, the 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 concept is still there, and the risk is still there. It's just harder to achieve. Achieving a risk, <laughs> achieving a consequence. Mm-hmm. But death does and should be a consequence in any game that is not taking place with outright full immortals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's an entirely different story, but you know. The, the the idea of let's not make death a consequence is just it's it, it it's I think that's indicative and exemplary of the whole we're not willing to commit mindset behind this document. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now beyond that, it goes it goes into it goes into some of the things with G with GM moves, um, adv advice if you get stuck, the whole thing with NPCs, and then um, what we mentioned when it com then the Forbidden Scroll adventure, which I which I um, elected that we are not that we are not going to go into because because there wouldn't be a whole lot of point. I mean, it's just it's a play module. We're 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 going over the meat and potatoes rather than a play module. Mm -hmm. And the the play module has a couple of things, uh, like a a clock used to track events mm -hmm. as part of the module. Yeah. So it has. It has characters that have been pre-gened for it and for the PCs. Um, location map, you know, what sort of things you might expect to see. And the... It's it's essentially what you would expect from just about any play module. It's got the, the, the general outline and, and things that could potentially happen and then you can just run with it mm -hmm. it's it's pretty bog standard there now when it but beyond but beyond all of that beyond all of that um i think i think i think that's an i think we've covered enough to kind of give our um our our final th our final thoughts on the, on this per, on this particular sor sorted affair. Mm -hmm. um, if the if this quick start is an indication of the kind of direction that they plan on going, because this does not feel in any way like early access. Mm -hmm. um, if this was early access, we'd we might see if we might see a few kinks in the army. We might see a link to a Discord or something like that in a tell us what tell us what you think kind of way, or do or doing some sort of or mentioning that they'll be doing some sort of survey. But I don't see anything like that. The most I saw was at the very beginning of the document. I think. Um, let me let me check real quick. <clears throat> If you have any questions or want to give feedback, you can head on over to our Magpie Games Discord server with the Discord server link. That's really it. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and their email address. Which, that's not, that's um that's that's bog standard. Um, you know, for a for a game about uh, Eastern Asian inspired fantasy worlds. And their insistence on uh, in back in the the dice breakers article about uh, you know, making sure representation is good and all that fun stuff. I see a, a lot of Hispanic names in the credits. Aren't eh. these aren't these the type of people that all, that always talk about how how um how only only people of the only people of their kind should be should be writing. This kind of thing. Eh, I'm I, I'm not going to make any assumptions about these people's races. Hispanic names could could be completely coincidental. They could all be Asians. Um, at the, at the, very, <laughs> at the well, um, did, wasn't there wasn't there that one numpty not too long ago who who came out who came out as transracial? <laughs> and and his and his pronouns were Cor and Ian. <laughs> God, what a fucking idiot. Um, he was taking the piss. Yeah. Still looked like a fucking idiot. Yes, but that was the entire point. Mm -hmm. he, got, he got his he got his point across by looking like a fool. Which but, uh, so sounds a little bit too much. Sounds a little bit too much like I was only pretending to be retarded. Yes, yes, that's very true. Um, so my final thoughts. Mm -hmm. This is weak. The entire premise is weak. Um, it's very generalized. It's uh, it has the the personality is all 
ephemeral. If you take anything that isn't a direct reference to something within the Avatar universe, such as when they say the words water bending or fire bending, etc., mm -hmm. um, or you know, bossing say air nomads, etc., um, the entire system could be transplanted anywhere else and not feel like it like it's misplaced. It's that generalist. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't commit to any of their ideas strongly enough to give it a sense of identity. And uh, as as you as you have pointed out, and as I have seen, uh, this this doesn't seem like an attempt to give you a sandbox to play a game in. It seems to give you a set of scripts for different roles in a story. And executed correctly, story games can be fun. This is not one that's executed correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, to use your, your rating system, where, where, are we, where are we doing a review? Uh, not recommended. Not recommended. Would you, <laughs> would you put it as a void? Definitely. <laughs> it's that a void. That's... that's that's very yeah, I, true. I don't. I don't have. I don't have a not recommended tier. I ha I have it as strongly recommended, recommended, play um playable, caution and avoid. I don't think I've seen any of your reviews of the void. I tend to skip around on those. I ha there. I I think I've, I think I've only done a I think I've only done avoid once in the last few years. It doesn't ha it doesn't happen often because you got to be a special kind of bad or just annoy me in a certain way to get that particular demerit. And it's yeah, a lot it's a lot harder to it's a lot harder to suck that bad, especially when you're dealing with with small people doing passion projects. Yeah, whereas the reason my reasoning for your rating of a void would be uh there are multiple resources out there that that do Avatar much better. The, and as we've discussed, one that it, it has legally distinct names to avoid copyright infringement, that is in PBTA. You know, Legend of the Elements is outright. They even had, didn't they, before he changed it, didn't they actually have just the Avatar names on it and everything? Yeah, he changed it so that he could sell it on DriveThruRPG, so he could sell the completed version on DriveThruRPG. Yeah, and so, and it does it's better. It does Avatar better. And then there's, of course, other systems that do Avatar better. There's no reason to play this when there are better designed, more committed, more, more sandbox, and, and more... Games with a sense of identity than this one. Mm -hmm. This this only has an identity because the identity has been painted onto the generalist framework. But paint thinner gets rid of that. The framework remains, and it can fit anywhere. It's not baked in. It's not intrinsic. And that's that's a shame because Avatar's world is rich as hell, and <clears throat> so long as we avoid. The uh, non better version of Korra. Hmm. <clears throat> and our ver our version's better. Plug plug. Yeah. <laughs> and um, look if I if I had the if I had the budget I would I would commission art for how for how our, for how our version of the gang would pro would probably do. And if um if stu if Image was still doing commissions, I would probably I would probably ask him to ask him to do to do a comic based on either a the um the gala scene with with Cora because I think <laughs> I think you can do prime comedy of, of somebody who is not used to wear not used to wearing a dress having to wear a dress that's always funny <laughs> or B the um the uh, the whole the whole gag with the T <laughs> I, th I think that was the best gag we came out of that simply because of how how it's a how it's a massive callback <laughs> mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that's you can't put you can't put ice in tea. That's not tea. That's just cold leaf juice. <laughs> I am. 
Go ahead. If, if, it, if it were me, I would say we just redesign everything to be legally distinct and ask if Studio Madhouse wants a new anime idea. Hey, at the very at the very least, it would be an anime that they could finish. <laughs> oh, that makes me sad now. Thanks, Monk! What can, what can I say except you're welcome? I, uh... I can respond, but uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't have to stoop that low. We're at the same level. Yeah. <laughs> um, my th- my final thoughts on a- on Avatar Legends. It, it this would this would work per- this would work perfectly well as a as a. As a in, as a introductory box set, if this was an introductory box, if the, if what they're presenting here was like an introductory box set to to the to the world of to the world of Avatar as they've presented it, I might not have been as harsh. The prob the problem is, I ha- I don't see enough I don't see enough in here that leads me to believe that they are that they are willing to let anyone customize they if they had if um some if they had done something as simple as discuss say what if scenarios that would have been one thing because one of the um one of the costs when you're dealing with a ver- when you're dealing with a rich setting which avatar is is the issue of continuity lockout and there, and it's also this is also the reason why I have always why throughout my entire life I have been hesitant to run R, to run RPGs or or at least when I'm commis- at least when I'm asked to by others in certain established IP. I can do it, I'm just a little bit hesitant about it. Some of these are bigger offenders than others. Lord of the Rings is perhaps the largest offender when it comes to this issue. Um but Star Wars also has this issue, although because of the size of the galaxy, I can kind of wiggle my way around things. Doctor Who most definitely has this issue because I have to deal with the unfortunate question of somebody wanting to play a Time Lord when I, and then getting mad when I say, no, you guys are all members of Unit, deal with it. Um, um, Star, Star Trek can, cert, can certainly have this issue, but again, very large setting, so there's a lot of, so there's a lot of room I could wiggle with. Avatar, its setting is certainly large, but a lot of that largeness is contained in very specific areas. In particular, the Earth Kingdom. Uh, yeah, almost all of the Earth Kingdom was experienced through bossing, say. Well, th- that and um, it's ve- it's very clear that, like we said, the Earth Kingdom is meant to represent is meant to be a representative of pre-revolution China. Yeah, it's. It's meant to be a, a representation of of United of China after the the Warring States periods, yeah. Mm-hmm. And because because of, because of that, you have a you have a great de- you have a great deal of di- of diverse kingdoms, cultures, and and whatnot. But the but the big the big issue the big issue that I ha- that I have is the fact that they are operating under the assumption that. The people at the table are going to be are going to be running a specific kind of coming of age story with it within your setup. That worked, and this is this is why I this is why I feel that them using Powered by the Apocalypse, despite my earlier reservations when when we covered this last time, is not the problem. The problem is the fact that they did not use. Powered by the apocalypse. This is not Avatar PBTA. This mm-hmm. is a masks a new generation hack of Avatar. That's where the problem lay because the you could do the you could focus on the coming of age story when it came to masks because what mask was trying to emulate wasn't wasn't all supers per se, but rather the but rather the young supers kind of archetype. You know, young, you know, um, young, Ju- young Justice, Avengers Academy, um, the um, Teen Titans, um, X Men, 
and mm-hmm. so on. And that's what that's why it was able to work within that particular niche. It wasn't trying to do a universal superhero kind of game. It was aiming for a specific kind of superhero and was laser focused on that. Mm-hmm. While Avatar can certainly do the coming of age story, especially given the target demographic that it's aiming for, its setting does not necessitate that that's the primary story that you have to tell. Especially mm-hmm. when we've seen other avatars who are significantly older. And there are certain and there are certain avenues and and stories that I don't that I don't think they're cons- that they're considering. They see they seem to have this I- the book seems to have this idea of your ca- of a def- of you predefining the arc that your character is going on. That veers a little bit too close to railroading for my taste. Yeah. And. Last, lastly, is the is the fact that some of the, is that several of the decisions when it comes to defining fighting styles end up working against themselves. The big the big thing is the, is treat is treating each of the individual trainings like classes, which and but at the at the same time wanting to be somewhat freeform with how with how the techniques work. Which is which, which the way that they're doing it runs counter to how PBTA is meant to work. One of the big appeals with PBTA's um, playbooks is that you have everything you need on the sheet. Mm-hmm. The way that they have the techniques set up, they are essentially feats. Feats are going to have their own little set of micro rules, and you're going to get more of them as you advance. Mm-hmm. But bec- and but because of, because of that, does it now? Does it allow? Does it allow for some build variety? Yes, but if you truly wanted variety of build, you wouldn't be using PBTA. It's not a system that's be- that's built to support that. I mean, you do have you do have advanced moves in a lot of playbooks, but ultimately all roads are going to lead to Rome. You're go. You're inevitably you're inevitably going to have all all the same moves on the on that playbook if you got two characters sharing the same playbook. That's just the way this works. Yeah. And what definitely doesn't exact definitely doesn't help that is the tiered setup that they have for the playbooks. The bit so the big pro- the overall big problem that I that I have is they. Clear, they clearly hadn't. They clearly had. There are clearly um, several ideas here that just don't mesh. There's not a unified voice. On the level up five e um, Valley of the Judged episodes th- for the last few weeks, we've talked about how it seems like different. Ru- how it seems like different people were writing different things on an individual class, and some of those things didn't mesh. Mm-hmm. That's the vibe that I get here. You have on one hand. You want a, you want a diversity of build with the fighting style system. On the other hand, you want the narrative focus and the narrative arcs from PBTA and the, and a specific set of narrative arcs from from Avatar. These two things clash, and instead instead of instead of instead of dumping one. And instead of um, either fo- either doubling down on one or the other, they tried to please both ends of their of their particular mantra. Because mm-hmm. when it, when it comes to this kind of thing, you either go you either double down on the narrative end, which is what Legend of the on the on the narrative archetype end, which is what Legend of the Elements does, or you do- or you double down on the variety of build, which is what the which is what say the D20 based hacks of Avatar have done or the um, age system hack of Avatar or even the anima hack of Avatar did. Yeah. You cannot do both. And if and even more so, if you want to do the whole variety of build thing, then you lose all claim to this being a fa- to this being a um family game. A family game is going to want to be simple. 
you're not going to see a whole lot. That's the reason you're not going to see a whole lot of crunch in, in say, Monopoly or Clue or Clue or Sorry or Shoots and Ladders or any of the family ga any of the games in Hasbro's Family Game Night line of board games. Because mm -hmm. they're meant to be for all ages, and thus they're meant to go for the widest demographics possible. That means you're going to be going simple. Yeah. But when you when you involve a degree of build complexity, you can't do that. You have, you are you are now you are now in the crunchy end of the spectrum. And if you want to be in the crunchy end of the spectrum, fine. It's been done before. You can do it. It's not impossible. But you can't have it both ways. Yep, and crunch is not always bad. No. I've I've made it I've made it clear I've made it fur furthermore as I said months ago you need to figure out whether you're doing a sandbox of the world of four nations or you're trying to or you're trying to have people replicate stories like on the show the latter <laughs> is a terrible idea because it's a waste of potential there are so many stories that can be told that don't fit that arc that they're trying to go for. And the fact the fact that they seemed that they seem to narrow down each er, each era into a specific kind of kind of storytelling style really helps illustrate my point that they that I'm not entirely sure if they fully understood what they what they have. Mhm. Mm the the idea the idea that any story in in Aang's era is going to be all about trying to restore hope how do you how do you know that that, that that's that that's exactly what they want to do hell how do you know how do you know, why um why should they why should they be going with the can, with the canon the way you describe it most G, most gms are going to want to tinker um and that and the big the biggest thing that I keep thinking is who is who this game is for. And honestly, as harsh as it is, this feels like a game for the actual play crowd. That is very harsh on my part. I will fully admit that. Mm -hmm. But that's who I keep coming to when I keep asking myself who this confused game is for. It is not for the people who actually sit down, do the crunch, and actually try and make the game their own. It is for the it is for the people who are only casually invested in the hobby of role of the hobby of role playing and are more interested in actual play podcasts or actual play streams. I'm not disparaging yeah. people who do that. There's plenty of people I know who do that. There's plenty of people I've had on the show who've done that. They're all awesome people. But eh, but actual play podcasts are not the same thing as getting your group together and sitting down at a table. Especially yeah. not the more performative streams. There's a there's a reason why I, why I asked my LGS to have a absolutely no Matt Mercer sign. <laughs> now, granted, I was the one who paid to have the sign made, but they still let they still let me put the thing in the building. Yeah. Oh. It wasn't wasn't all what it wasn't all that expensive. It only cost me seventy five bucks. Which for a custom sign, that's actually cheap. True. But the but the but the the reason what the reason why I why I say that kind of thing is because it's clear it's clear that that when it comes to when it comes to the characters made, despite the complexity that could be had in fighting style. It still wants people to take us to take a certain arc. It still wants people on the road to Rome. Mm -hmm. And the whole time, when I was reading through the document, I kept asking myself: Would this have been better served, either utilizing its old own system or utilizing um, a system that isn't PBTA? And honest, honestly. I think I think um I think it might I think it might work a little bit better but not by but not by much because there's still the issue of it of its direction being very confused. Mm -hmm. So overall I am I am certainly going to give this a st I'm going to give this personally a stamp of avoid because it's vi it's very it's very clear that they had that 
in tr that um if they had if they had done this as a straight up PBTA game this would have worked hell we've seen it work that's why we that's why we brought up legend of the elements avatar and PBTA can work i want to make that explicitly clear mm -hmm. however having so much of masks dna and using that as your framework which they th they said that they felt that that was an ideal framework to capture the spirit of the show no it's o you're ca you're capturing the spirit of the show that's where the problem lays you should not be when i um a long time ago i was i was asked to do a ta <coughs> to do a, ta a tabletop adaptation of Ghost in the Shell. This has mm -hmm. nothing to do with the with the one that um, that DSX Machina did way back in the day. I wasn't. I was. I was using a. I was using a modified version of Cyberpunk's rule set instead instead of D twenty Modern. Um. But I I ended up looking through the manga. I looked through. I looked through both of the movies, and I looked through um. The first season of Standalone Complex. The second second gig hadn't come out yet. Yeah. And one of the th one of the things that I one of the things that I need that I needed to I needed to make clear to myself is what sort of g is what sort of game was being made. Now I will admit I will admit that a lot of the stuff I made up of whole cloth. Some stuff was heavily inspired by Night City because it's a good framework to use, but. In a, but in a lot of cases, I I had put the, I had felt that one of the main things that needed to be done is to, is to veer more into equal parts detective and spy thriller. And and an un, and understood agreement that the player characters were members of some of some sort of organization that they were answerable to, whether it be public security, a mer, a mercenary outfit, or some other government department. Mm -hmm. Um and that that was simply to, that was simply the main and I will admit that's where I took the most influence from um standalone complex because of the because of how many stories were episodic it let it let me have a good framework the po the point is I was not interested in tell I was not interested at all in telling the sto in telling stories like the story of the major like the story of Saito like the story of Bato like the story of Togusa I was interested in the story of Tokyo. Yeah. And that is and that is not the approach that Avatar Legends is taking. They are interested in replicating the show the show Avatar the Last Airbender and Avatar the Legend of Korra. I know that they I know that they mention the graphic novels and the novels as as well in this document. But that still doesn't change the fact that they're more interested in replicating thing the things the um things like the source material instead of utilizing the setting that the source material made. Now mm -hmm. I could I could be dead wrong. There could be an extensive um world of world of Avatar chapter in the full book. But the problem is the way that the way that they have character creation and advancement designed is still replicating the coming of age story. And be, now I'm the I'm now the game is still the game is still going to do well enough because it's got the name, but much like I said with Coyote and Crow a few months ago, I'm not entirely sure how long this game is how long this thing is going to last. I fe I feel like once the bloom is off the rose, a lot a lot of the people who are jumping on this aren't gonna stick. Mm -hmm. Or and the and um the peep the people who are who are diehard fans and role players are probably doing this exact kind of thing with another system. That's why I was that's why I was so perplexed at the at this matter and why why I felt that they had a lot to live up to because. Avatar as as a um, setting that's been around for so long has been done plenty of times by fans, and some of them and some of them have done very good jobs with it. So you've got you've got something that you that you got to compare to. And I know I know that was a bit I know that was a bit long and rambly on my part, but I I want to 
I, w I do not want to come at this from a position of hate. I genuinely wanted to like this. I, w I was cautiously optimistic when this was announced. Because Magpie Games does other, thi does other things than PBTA. Um, for example, Root. That's one of that's one of their projects, and it's not, and I don't consider them hacks either because stuff like Bluebeard's Bride was really good. But th but this was this was just a conf a confused mess that wants to go in two directions at once and is left spinning plates. And because of that, I can safely say that if I'm asked to cover to cover to cover this when it comes out you are more likely me to see me go fuck that we're covering legend of the elements instead it won't be a long review because it's because it's hard to talk at length about a PBTA game mechanically mm -hmm. but i would feel i would feel a lot more comfortable talking about that than i w than i would about avatar legends yeah because it executes the idea so much better. Mm -hmm. So, Magpie, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Well, I'm mad, but that's only because you decided to divorce everything from bending, which is, you know, the linchpin of that fucking setting. Mm -hmm. But with all that said, that... I think is go I think is going to be a good capstone for us for us to leave off on when it comes to this particular um, particular adve particular adventure into the Valley of the Judged. We will be back with the with the exploration with Level Up Five E on Friday, and of and of co and of course keep an eye out for some for some other fun stuff com coming your way as there always is on this open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>